Hey, everybody. Welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Weekly Roundup for the training week ending December 1st, 2023. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Well, this week's theme is, will the rally that we had in November, and folks, it was a very strong rally, is that going to continue into the month of December? Well, why don't we get into the details here and just kind of go through it a little bit here. Uh, and let me just move forward here and let's just kind of see where we're sitting. This past week, yes, the rally finished off November very strong. I mean, November saw the S&P up over 8.9% for the month. NASDAQ was up over 10.7%. And the Dow made new highs. It was up over 8.5% or so, making new 2023 highs. And remember, the Dow was in the uh, red um I would say about five weeks ago, it was in the red. So just a very, very strong rally. Uh, more on the details on what moved the markets in, in a second. But you can see here that everybody's in the green year to date solidly. Even the Russell uh, had a good week up over 3%. Best performer for the week was real estate, no doubt, because interest rates came down very hard. Communication services was the worst. Year-to-date, technology is bringing up the, the charge. Utilities just having a really awful year, down 29.13%. P.E. ratio to me is still fairly rich, given uh, where we are with interest rates currently. Ford P.E. and the trailing 12-month P.E. are almost right on top of each other, so essentially flat. Dividend yield in the S&P is 1.52, 10-year Treasury. 4.23, so it's higher than the dividend yield by 271 uh, basis points, 2.71%. So that still encourages money to go into Treasury. Um, the earnings yield is 4.8. The Ford earnings projection right now is 220. It looks like that's where it's going to be for this year, but I suspect we're seeing some estimates where it can come in uh, or go up next year. Um, but I think they're probably being a little bit overly optimistic for earnings growth for next year. Uh, and then you can see the current VIX actually came down for the week. We're back into the 12 handle at 12.63. The prior week, it was a little over 13.8. So the VIX is down around 8.5% for the week. Okay. So we've got, and by the way, out of the money puts are very cheap right now. The cheapest they've been in quite some time. Um, and we did see good news on the inflation front. I mean, in addition to November being just a really kick-ass month, we got the uh, PCE, which is the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, or Price Index. The Feds follow that very closely. Uh, and its year-over-year year year, uh, increase uh, fell to 3.5%, still well above the Fed's 2% target, but it's going in the right direction. That's the lowest level it's been since April 2021, right? Uh, and the core PCE is even lower. It's down at an annualized rate of 2.5%. So um, it's going in the right direction. That's helping the markets. Um, personal spending rose 20 basis points in September, smallest increase in six months, while personal income also rose 20 basis points as well. So the consumer, which is 70% of the GDP, is still spending. Oh, they're starting to tighten the wallets just a little bit, okay? And like I said, uh, this past week, interest rates have just come down dramatically, um, or this past month, rather. Just, just They've fallen out of, out of bed, okay? The U.S. 10-year fell 52 and a half basis points just in the month of November alone. All right, that's a lot for the 10-year. It's the biggest drop in four years. Bonds had their best month since the 80s. All right, the 30-year bond, just you remember when bonds move up, interest rates move lower. So interest rates are cooperating, and the price action in the um, equity market absolutely loves it. And on top of that, Christopher Waller, who is known as a hawkish voting Fed member, pretty much surprised investors this past week when he said that he's getting more confident that um, the uh, interest or the inflation is coming down back to the 2% level. In fact, he told the audience that if inflation continues to moderate over the next three to five months, we could start lowering interest rates. So we're going to come into a, a big key meeting, not this next week, but the week after December 13th at the Fed meeting. Remember, the last dot plot 
and they do these once a quarter. Um, the last dot plot by the Fed showed two rate cuts in 2024. The markets are now saying four rate cuts, maybe even five. So there's a big uh, dichotomy between these two. Um, and that's part of the reason why the equity markets are kind of front running this thing, assuming the Fed's going to be cutting rates next year more than what the Fed's say they're doing. Uh, and the markets don't believe the Fed's when they say, well, we could hike the rates if inflation changes and goes back up. So the, the markets right now are, 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 you know, kind of front loading some of these rate cuts in the equity prices. So that it, we have to still be very careful of. Um, because if the feds prove right, meaning they're only going to cut two, maybe three times, and the markets are expecting four or five rate cuts, we're going to get a downside adjustment in, in price action. Okay. And then, of course, if we come over to Europe, take a look at the Eurozone, you can see everybody was in the green from the Euro stocks, FTSE, CAC 40, DAX, all in the green, year to date, all well in the green, except for the FTSE. They're just barely hanging on. All right. We did see over there in Europe, just like here, that uh, inflation is coming down. CPI there fell to 2.4% uh, um, in uh, uh, more than expected, actually 2.4% in November from an expected um, 2.9 or is 2.9 in October. So it's coming down very strong. The expectation was 2.7. So it came in at 2.4. Um, so that's helping the Europe European economy, because they're not doing very well over there. They're worse off than the U.S. as far as economic growth goes. Core inflation over there also dropped to 3.6 from 4.2. Jobless rates holding steady around 6.5%. But just like the feds here, both the ECB and the Bank of England are pushing back on the market's perception of rate cuts coming sooner rather than later. So we've got all the central banks from um, uh, England to the Eurozone to the US saying that, you know, they're not ready to start cutting rates yet, that the markets are saying they should. So this is all going to work itself out, guys, in the next 60 to 90 days. OK, and the surprise can be both an upside or a downside. I think the downside would be larger than the upside because the upside is pretty much priced in right now for four rate cuts next year. Meanwhile, if we look at the Asian markets, you can see both Nikkei China and Hang Sen, which is Hong Kong, all down in the red this week. And China and Hang Sen are bringing up the rear. They're red all year long. China right now through uh, Friday's close is down 1.87% for the year. Hang Sen, which is a Hong Kong index, is in cor official correction territory down 14.83%. Okay. And looking at Japan, it's still a healthy 28.12% up. A big part of that is their administration, their, um, their, their prime minister, Kushida, uh, is still basically saying that they're going to put more stimulus out there, about $110 billion, you know, in his administration. That's what they're doing. Um, and they basically could not say with conviction, the Bank of Japan, that they're going to loosen their monetary or tighten their monetary policy, uh, even though inflation right now is running over 2%. So we'll see how uh, um, that's going to play itself out. Uh, they're still pumping stimulus in, just like China. And speaking of China, you know, red year to date in the, um, in the weeds year to date, um, same thing with Hong Kong. We're getting data out of there that is still not too pretty. The PMI data that purchasing manufacturers or ma a manager's index fell to 49.4 November. Okay. It was 49.5 in October. So it's stuck in a contraction territory. Remember anything below 50 is contraction, right? The non-manufacturing PMI or the services closed out the month at 50.2, but it was at 50.6 in October. So they're all going in the wrong direction. Meanwhile, profits, across most of the corporate uh, entities in China through the first 10 months of the year, fell by 7.8% from a year ago, all right? Um, so that's just basically all of this data is showing that there's still a lot of concerns in China about a recovery trying to get solid footing. I mean, they're starting to kind of consolidate down here, but it's still ugly um, as evidenced by their year-to-date um, stock market um, index performance. Same thing with uh, uh, Hang Sen. 
What I want to do is shift the screen over real quick, show you a couple of key charts. Uh, let me just move it over here. We're going to take a look at the E-mini S&P 500 futures. Um, and you're going to see over here just this huge move up uh, in the month of November. I mean, it, another five seconds it should be showing on your screen. But you can see <clears throat> um, this was the October low, which was on October 27th. Um, and then October uh, 30th, we had a little bit of a reprieve, but it just, it's like a V bottom. And then it just took off. I mean, it's just, it was almost like someone flipped the switch. The markets didn't change that quick, but we got some sense from the, um, some of the Fed members talking um, and interest rates that rates were coming down. Um, growth, consumer spending was still strong for the holidays. All right. So we saw strong consumer spending for both Black Friday um, and um, Cyber Monday. These are holidays in the U.S. where consumers go out and see how much money they can spend or put on credit, which, by the way, is over a trillion right now for U.S. consumer credit card debt. So that's going to start to bite, I believe, in Q1 and Q2 of next year. But as I told you guys uh, in our last session, this shaded zone here, the only way to get up and make new highs, I suspect. Now, we could do this, but we're going to get the feds on December 13th. And that's going to really tell us where the rally through the end of this year is going to go. Right? I think the markets are making the assumption the feds are going to cut more than they're saying uh, or they don't believe them. Uh, and, and Boom Boom Powell's job is going to be basically trying to talk the markets down just a little bit because all of this big, fast movement creates a lot of um, economic growth and it, it can keep inflation higher for longer. OK, so we're going to watch this very closely to see where we're going. You can see here the 2023 high um, in the E-minis was last made on uh, July 27th. And it was up 19.81%. And we're pretty darn close to there right now. Okay. And just looking at it. And of course, if we look at the Russell, the Russell, um, you can see here the Russell was in the red as of uh, November 14th. And now it's in the green. You can see we broke out of this range here. It was almost like a bull flag. And then boom, we just broke out of it. A lot of conviction here. If we look at the volume, you can see volume also is coming up on these last three days here on uh, the last um, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. See how volume just picked up right here. So that's conviction. Um, even though the 50 is below the 200, we have to treat the chart like a bear market chart. But regaining both the 50 and the 200 um, is a good thing. Now, I think we're going to see some backfilling here back to the 200 EMA, give the 50 EMA a chance to catch up and cross back again. Um, and that should finish us out for the year. You can see intra, um, the market actually on um, the, uh, the Russell on is, is just four weeks ago on, on uh, October 27th. That was down over 18.78% from the highs that were made in August. Right. So August, September and October were very ugly for the Russell, almost in a bear market. And then we bounced back up. All right. And for our members and I was talking about doing the pair trade where you're selling or you're shorting Nasdaq and you're going along the Russell. And, and that turned out for for folks that know how to do it. Um, really a very good trade. And, and for our members, I'm, I'm going to probably add that pair trade. How, a best way to do it and set it up uh, in our option masters so that that way you guys will see how to put on a pair trade, whether you're using um, stocks, futures or options on the trade. So this is the Russell. And then, of course, if we look at NASDAQ, let me find NASDAQ on here. You can see NASDAQ also made new all time highs. You can see volume coming up on NASDAQ as it's coming into this area right here. Um, and you can see. We made new all-time highs in NASDAQ back over here on November 27th, just a few days ago. And it's up 32.38%. Okay. Um, very strong numbers. I'm going to take this off the screen right here so it clears it up just a little bit. And you could see here that overhead, we got a lot of resistance. We got a 21, 2021 closing price, a 2022 high price, and a November 22nd, 2021 all-time high price, right? 
for those that were in technology or NASDAQ at the beginning of um, uh, January 2022, you're still just now coming out of the red, barely coming out of the red, if that, right? Because you could see where the closing price was in 2021, okay? So you're still in some respects in the red, even though we've had a good move here. So essentially, this big move in NASDAQ is just a reversion back to the 10-year trend line that NASDAQ has had, um, you know, because last year, everything was ugly in NASDAQ. I mean, it was very, very ugly. So we're just kind of reverting back to the mean. So yes, this was a strong year, but um, I think things are going to go back to a trend and we're not going to see these kind of moves again, right? Um, and then, of course, just to show you guys a little bit of breath here, you can see this ratio chart of the equal weight SPX to the SPX. By moving up in this direction means we're getting more participation by other stocks outside of that Magnificent Seven, all right? And that's what I want to see. Um, it's not as strong as I would like, but I mean, if we were to just look at just the the, the uh, equal weight SPX, we were uh, like the Russell. It's running just like the Russell, slightly a little bit stronger, but running like the Russell, right? And we're we should get the 50 cross in the 200 again. This is what I want to see for continued growth uh, in the equity markets because we cannot continue to have just those seven or eight or nine stocks drive the markets. We need to see participation by other um, uh, uh, companies, and that's what we're getting here on this. We're still not up very much. I mean, if I were to just do a quick back of the napkin measurement from the closing price of last year, we're only up about 6% for the year. So only a few stocks have had a really great year. The rest, just an average ho-hum year. We're going to see all of this revert back to a mean, I think, over the next year, year and a half, okay, as some of these AI stocks wind down some of their huge gains. Um, and we're going to see that kind of continue through. If we look at the FANG index, even the FANG, um, you can see here it made all-time highs uh, over here on the 22nd or a high price for November, rather, on the 22nd, up over 76%. But you can see the fangs have been moving down just a little bit. Same thing with the Magnificent 7, right? The Magnificent 7 also made a all-time high, or the 2023 high on the 27th, 22nd of this month. And now it's been peeling back as well. It was up 88%. And this accounts for like, uh, the upper 20% level of the weighting of the S&P, you know, 26, 27% of the S&P is driven by these seven stocks, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Amazon, Meta, Netflix, Tesla, and Google, right? They drive this, the, 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 the markets right now. Um, we're going to see this back off a little bit and hopefully get some more breath for some of these other stocks. That would be great. Um, treasuries, look at the bonds. Look at Friday. It was up two full handles. I mean, the bonds um, are just screaming up off the lows that were made here. Now, this was my original target for bonds, 114. It actually came all the way down here um, to 107, right? Uh, and now we're moving back up in this area. And remember, when bonds move up, interest rates move down, okay? Um, and this is suggesting we could get a little bit of a pullback. I would see a little bit of a backfill here, back another one or two full handles in the bonds, which means interest rates will move up just a little bit. But if we look at the interest rates, we look at the uh, tenure, um, you can see here, it's just come down very hard. And if I were to blow this out just a little bit so I can increase the size here for you guys. Um, and let me just get, let me turn my, uh, my, drawing tool on here for you guys but i'm going to do it in a in a not too accurate but you're going to get the idea you got that you got that you got that and when you draw that like that you get a uh, left shoulder you get a head and then you get a right shoulder over here right uh, and then when you look at it from that perspective and then you want to calculate what is the target down below i could just turn this on and say from the head down to the neckline right there, right? 
and then I can move it down from the neckline. Well, let's move, let's get it back in here again. Let's move it down from the neckline to get that down there. And that would suggest a target of around 4% to 3.93 3 to 4%, right? That would suggest the target. Notice here, we got the 200 EMA sitting at 4.17. So this would suggest we could possibly go down a little bit more. Now, this would be very bullish, the equity markets, right? I mean, it would be bullish equity markets, and that would allow the rally to continue uh, through the end of this year into uh, uh, January. So again, a lot of this, guys, is going to be determined by what Boom Boom Powell, that would be our Fed chair, Jerome Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell, what he says um, on December 13th. And remember, it's a quarter in, so we're also going to get their dot plot. So we're going to get, and right before that, I think on the 12th, we get CPI, core and headline CPI. So we got a lot of data coming out that week that's going to really determine where we go from here with conviction, all right? Um, and of course, if we look at the U.S. dollar here, you can see the U.S. dollar is coming down um, big time. We're back just barely in the red for the year. Now, the euro, I remember I was telling our members, we want to look at going long the euro. Um, and you could see where the euro is. I mean, we've had the cross in the 50 EMA. We've had this little bit of a profit taking move here. I do believe the euro is going to move higher. It's a buy the dip kind of moment. Um, and I think it's going to continue to move way up over 111 to the dollar, right? Now, and the yen is another one that I like being long in, and just giving you guys a little heads up here on, the, on our free blog on the weekend. Um, I love the yen being long. Now, I think it's going to settle in here a little bit, but I think that by the summer of next year, it's going to be over the 200 EMA, right? Um, and they're just really great ways to trade that. We've talked about it in our group. Now, gold made new all-time highs. It snuck in there, right? Uh, 2023 high and all-time high. It took out the prior all-time high way back. Let's go way back over here. Let's get back in time here. Way back made over here um, back in 2020, right? In August, we came up here, we made new all-time highs. Now the question is, is it gonna come back down like this or is it gonna settle in here and move higher, right? Um, if we look at it, and you may say, well, why is gold moving up, right? Well, we got interest rates coming down, so that means gold doesn't do as well when interest rates are higher. We got a huge budget deficit, and I do believe that gold is probably going to see 2100 before it sees um, 1800 again, right? I do believe we're just going to have a little bit of a backfill, but you want to be a buy the dip on gold, right? So that would be a little bit of my my take on where we're with gold. Copper is known as Dr. Copper. It kind of tracks the economy, global economy. And this is saying that now that all the central banks are done raising rates, that's off the table. And now we could have a Goldilocks scenario or a soft landing here in the US and Europe may not be that bad. This thing can go up higher, right? So this is a vote of a, pl a plus vote for the global economy. It is a buy the dip on any pullback. Um, once we, you could see here where we sat at the, it's a little bit of a bull flag going on here. We sat at the 50, I mean the 200 EMA and then the minute it took it out, you got a, 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 a long signal, uh, in copper. Okay. Uh, some of that's being augmented by some problems with some copper mines as well. So that's a little bit about where we're sitting here. Oil right now is all about OPEC plus. Uh, and their production cuts, whether they believe they're going to do them or not, it's coming down. I think there's more downside in oil. Now, remember, oil is also a good prognosticator of recession. So we're going to see some really interesting data coming out in Q1 of next year. We got earnings data for Q4 coming out in January and February. We got, um, I think, inflation is pretty much behind us, but I want to see where we're going to go with the interest rate uh, cuts and how they're going to put them into the uh, game plan. Earnings and consumer spending um, and credit and available credit and real estate could be the could be the uh, the undoing of the markets in late 24 into 2025. OK. All right, everybody, that's a really quick uh, roundup of uh, the markets as I see them right now in our user group. Members, I will see you Sunday evening for a little bit more detail on some of the things that we I see some action in. 
Have a great uh, weekend, everybody. Enjoy the football for all of you football fans out there. Take care, folks. Ciao now.